Good morning. You're just in time. Welcome to the St. Gabriel Cafe, your sacred space to sip on today's local blend of faithful encouragement. Let's start our day together. Good morning, amigos. Come on in, <laughs> pull up a chair. I'm Dave Orsborn. And I'm Amanda Miller, and we're thrilled to have you here with us in the St. Gabriel Cafe, our live and local morning show. Cam Clutter's our barista, and oh. <laughs> howdy. This morning, Mercedarian Father Daniel Bowen is in the cafe with us, and we're going to read and reflect on the parable of the prodigal and his brother from Luke chapter 15. Looking forward to it. I think it'll be a really nice show today. I think so, too. Can I start with a prayer? Yes, please. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm, Good morning, Father. As this day breaks, we want to praise and give you glory today and forever. From Psalm 105, let the hearts that seek the Lord rejoice Turn to the Lord in his strength, constantly seeking his face. So, Father, this morning we pray um, for forgiveness and uh, repentance that when uh, we stray from you, that, um, that you bring us back. We pray for our family members and friends that have strayed um, away from you, uh, that they, uh, too, uh, again, may come close to you. We pray for those that are anxious and fearful this morning, that they may know your love, uh, that they may know your son uh, in an intimate and profound way. Mm, And just his love, his mercy, your kindness for all of us. Mother Mary, Mary, we pray that uh, you lead us uh, closer to the sacred heart of Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Just before the show, I told Amanda I wasn't going to say friends. And you said amigos. Kind of threw you there, you didn't did. I? did. <laughs> and then Cam threw in a howdy. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew another language. <laughs> Throw something else in there. There's How- time. I'll work on it. Okay. Howdy isn't another language. Well, you, okay, you're right. <laughs> you're right, Cam. It's Texan. Yeah. <laughs> How are you today? Oh, doing pretty good. How about you, Dave? Oh, wonderful. I had my holy hour last night in the oh, men's group. So, so good. Such a good way to spend an evening. Yeah. 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 Amanda, we learned <laughs> from a number of our friends through the course of the Spirit Drive. And uh, I think at the women's and men's conferences, they were really, really invested in your volleyball career. Thank you so much, everyone who is rooting for me. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll be more, <laughs> more professional. <laughs> I'm working on it. Volleyball season's over. It's right, yeah. Tell us what's coming up next. Okay. Well, for, for those of our friends who have been following us and even heard our New Year's resolution slash non-resolutions uh talk in the cafe i i prefer i'm this year i'm going to be more of a yes person and push myself out of my comfort zone and i decided i've never done a marathon before but just running sounds horrible (laughs) so so i'm going to do an obstacle race and so coming in june i will be doing the savage race in zanesville ohio the savage race. savage race so i'm in the midst of of preparing for that have you worked on your savage face not yet so you're, you're way too smiley <laughs> for a savage race you're right i have to work on it <laughs> so last year coming out of your comfort zone was uh to host a morning yeah a live morning show <laughs> how's that going to compare you think with uh, a savage race you know i guess we'll just have to wait and find out <laughs> I'll let you know. I'm very intrigued to hear what the obstacles are. 
in the savage race? I hope it's not like a tough mutter. I've never done anything like this before, but that just sounds horrible. Give me so. like the sand crawl underneath, you know, the yeah. nets and stuff. Bob wire and, and things. Monkey bars. But not like the little kid playground monkey bars, like the ones that like almost rip your arm out of your socket <laughs> kind of thing. They're like swinging as you're swinging. Right, right. right. And there's fire and sharks. Well, and- that's it. I, I, I was thinking more biblical, you know, so let's, let's have like a pit of fire. The lion's uh, den. Yeah, yeah. A plague of locusts. Y- yeah. Oh, yeah. We should yeah. just start our own. <laughs> a biblically accurate savagery. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So the, that's that's what's coming up in my life. So prayers and, for that, please. And the date again of the race? Um, it will be in June, the end of June. Good. Mm-hmm. Good. So stay tuned, folks, <laughs> amigos. So today we're going to spend our time in the cafe uh, reading and reflecting on uh, the parable of the prodigal son, also known as the parable, the parable of the prodigal and his brother. The prodigal, the brother, the father. So, um, we're. I could safely say that we're all familiar with this passage, mm-hmm. but it's so rich, and there's so many ways to uh, to pray through that, and that's what we wanted to do this morning. So, to put it into some context, this is uh, from Luke chapter 15. Uh, Jesus is speaking to uh, the tax collectors and sinners as well as some Pharisees and scribes. And how, how was chapter 15 referred to, Cam? Oh. At the chapter of the lost and found. Yeah, right? the Luke's lost and found department. Now, I, <laughs> I don't want to misattribute that to myself. I think it's Father Thomas Blau here in the diocese who calls it that, but I, I may be incorrect. So. Okay. so chapter 15 begins with the parable of the lost sheep, then there's the parable of the lost coin. Then the third parable, starting at verse 11, is the parable of the prodigal and his brother. So, Cam, would you like to read it for us? Absolutely. Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the son, the younger son, gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. And he replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then the older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. 
But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property, and with prostitutes you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Amen. Thank you, Cam. Hmm. There are so many things there, so many things to to pull out, not only being lost and found, but even this idea of repentance, this idea of mercy, love, and compassion that the Father has on the Son who returns. And I think there's just going to be so much we, yeah. we can dive into today. I look forward to uh, bringing Father Daniel Bowen into the conversation which we will do in just a couple minutes. Friends, you're listening to the St. Gabriel Cafe. Stay with us. Coming up next, Father Daniel Bowen. Welcome back, friends, to the St. Gabriel Cafe. I'm Amanda Miller. I'm Dave Orsborn, and joining us now here in the cafe, Mercedarian Father Daniel Bowen. Good morning, Father. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone? Wonderful. Welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be back. Always a pleasure. So we have quite the parable in front of us here. Um, Yes, indeed we do. Actually, why don't we start with the title? Um, Yeah. It's referred to variously as the prodigal son, the prodigal and his brother. Yeah, but interestingly, I I heard a homily uh, as I was in preparation, and I thought there was such a good point that was stated because uh, the priest was sharing with the audience just that, you know, the titles of the chapters came much later. This was not something that was written in when, um, when they were being described right Mm -hmm. and so what he was sharing was how do we know which one is the prodigal son or uh, the title wasn't really there so we added it and and who's to say that they're both not prodigal so i thought that was Mm. a very interesting insight there when prodigal means extravagant right right a person who spends money maybe recklessly or in an extravagant way Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm and it could also apply to the father, as we will oh, uncover Dave. in in his mercy. So the prodigal father. Interesting. Dun, dun, dun. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Looking forward to your thoughts on that, Dave. <laughs> so the parable begins, uh, again, friends, uh, Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 11 to 30-something. 32. 32, thank you. <laughs> there, 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 there was a man who had two sons. So, yeah, it should also make mention this parable is only found in the Gospel of Luke. Right. So, this is uniquely Lucan. And uh, so. Is there something we should read into that? Why do you think it's only in Luke? Well, we could say, you know, the audience that Luke is coming from, right? Writing largely for uh, a Greek audience in that. And, uh, you know, him coming being a physician, you know. Um, so a lot of different reasons we could pack into that, but uh, definitely worth the time and attention because mm-hmm. if we're only into the Matthew gospel, well, we're going to miss this. That's true. If we're only into John, that's again, the beauty of the all having all four gospels, each one, while certainly the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are similar, there are things uniquely in each one of them. And that's why it takes the time to become familiar with each of them mm. and the beauty of having especially here in the Catholic Church with the liturgical cycle, bringing different ones at different times and seasons Mm -hmm. to allow us to kind of have the full flavor. Again, when you're looking, we're looking to encounter the person of Jesus Christ, you've got these four beautifully painted portraits in each of these Gospels that together help to bring like a 3D image, we could say, you know. And uh, again, what a gift of God, right, in... in, um, 
uh, allowing us to experience that and to bring that to us across the ages, you know, so, um, but, um, so, so in setting up this, um, this parable, the, uh, Jesus is speaking to two groups, um, sinners and tax collectors, and then also the Pharisees and scribes. So I've, I've seen a comparison made, um, from those two groups to the two sons. So you have insiders and outsiders, the outsiders being the tax collectors and sinners would compare to the younger son and the insiders, those that are still within Hmm. the father's house as being the Pharisees. And so he's speaking to, to this audience, expecting them to see their own situations here in the parable with the with the two sons absolutely absolutely our lord trying to reach right again is, and is trying to reach everyone you know and help them to under have a better understanding of who they may be again he's trying to turn uh, allow for introspection right and to allow our conventions and our way of thinkings to be challenged so that we can do some more self-exploration and say you know where am i uh with my God, but with my brother and sister, mm. you know, and not being trying to be oblivious of one or the other, right? Both are needed to help us to see our place uh, and uh, where we are presently, you know, where there might be opportunity for, for growth or, or, or a reappreciation. Uh, so important. Uh, and of course, uh, would you like to hear what John Paul said kind of just overall on this? Of I always course. love to hear what John always. Paul II so has just to say. <laughs> yeah. Briefly, and again, you know, this is one of the most beautiful parables. Again, this is one that, that speaks to the heart. Um, and of course, when you first read this, I think most of us kind of tend to go towards that one son that, that spent the, you know, everything and cashed out, you know, and he came back, I'm the bad guy, because maybe... Some of us have done that, or that's been our story, mm-hmm. or we know someone, or that's been their story. Uh, uh, but um, again, it's teaching us about God, right? And so, uh, what John Paul has to say here, he says, although the word mercy does not appear, this parable nevertheless expresses the essence of the divine mercy in a particularly clear way. That son who receives from the father the portion of the inheritance that is due to him and leaves home to squander it in a far country in loose living, in a certain sense is the man of every period, beginning with the one who was the first to lose the inheritance of grace and original justice. The analogy at this point is very wide-ranging. The parable indirectly touches upon every breach of the covenant of love, every loss of grace, every sin. Hmm. This is coming from John Paul II's Dives in Misericordia in in his paragraph 5. Hmm. In, 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 in this parable, then, both, both sons have lived in the father's house, right? So they've yeah. experienced um, the father's love um, growing up. But the parable starts with the, with the younger son saying, this isn't enough for me. Mm. And he makes, in, in a very dramatic way, to turn his back on the father's love and mercy to the understanding of the audience that basically is saying you're dead to me now, father. Yeah. I'm going to, I want the money that's due to me later. I want it now and I'm going to live the life that I want. And haven't we all at some point in our lives done that? Um, maybe not running off to a far and distant land, but in, in some regard, walking away from what we know is good and beautiful and true, but thinking that we can find something better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or even the idea of control and that, like 
using maybe our gifts, our talents that God has given us and using it to our own ends, our own means, or going off and, and forsaking the Father and doing our own will. Well, and he wasn't even making, like, uh, you know, I'm going to go off and start my own farm. Right. You know, or <laughs> I'm going to invest this money. Mm-hmm. Now, he set out to squander it, right? I mean, just on 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 passions. Right. That makes me think of just the the seeking heart or the the heart that is you know very much desiring to be filled with good things and yet we know we know that in every sin and everything that we're looking for or desiring there is a good and yet so often we we can miss the mark any any sin that we turn towards maybe a desire for something good but but missing the mark in, in a way that distorts it and uh, and i see this very much in the prodigal son the younger son who he goes off and spends it on frivolous things, on maybe wanting to build his prestige or maybe wanting to wear extravagant things or to spend it on money or loose living. And it just sounds like he's trying to fill his heart in some way, trying to figure out maybe in what way um, can I actually fill what I truly desire? Mm-hmm. And how often in our lives have we done that or fall back into that? Father? Yeah, absolutely. I guess to put it in kind of a, the last few generations kind of terms, he's kind of blowing it on sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, in a sense, the things that our world will say to us, you need, or that we feel we need, or we're socially uh, conditioned to think that this is the most important thing. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, of course, it's, it's a coming of age thing. I mean, we, we all kind of go through these stages to a lesser or greater degree of to to become our own person in a sense to to uh, uh, c- cut the umbilical cord there has to come that point uh, whether that's you know in our uh, starting in our middle school age or, or or high school or college you know there's a healthy aspect of that but then there's an unhealthy aspect and we can begin by even reflecting on this parable getting those dynamics and of course we'll come back and look at the father but even seeing that from a parental role or or from uh, again god as the father kind of role mm-hmm. but uh so it, the the younger and the older son both are kind of two different uh approaches to that coming of age you know that we might take or or some a little bit of both or maybe we can find a little bit of ourselves being one way or the other or at one point in our life and, and versus the other but it's important to consider these things yeah what what really is most important in life and again you can see very much for in the prodigal son the younger son he is really just saying you know kind of in your face give me what i got coming and i'm out of here and i don't need your wisdom i don't need your perspective on life i'm done with you like really i mean it's it's very blatant and uh and the father grants him it that's the there's another thing of course we'll come back and talk look at the father but he just okay here you go and off he goes and again, goes the way of the world. Um, you know, I, I, I know I personally had a phase in my life before I was a, a Catholic um, and before I was a priest that where I, I tried some of on what the world said, this is what this will make you happy in life. You don't need God or faith. You just need to buy this thing. This will definitely make you happy. So get your credit card out and get it for you now. <laughs> you know, you can pay, you know, and then... Uh, so I, I would I tried that. I would buy this thing. I'd be happy happy for like half a second and look everybody what I've got. You know, look how great I am, everybody. Mm-hmm. And then when people weren't like, Oh yes, you're so great, you begin, oh well maybe that just wasn't the thing, right? If I just get that thing, the bigger car, the better clothes, you know, then that'll certainly impress but then you 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 follow this rat race and, and then it can of course you can run yourself in big debt. And it's depressing, right? Because mm. you're like, it never really promised what it said that it would in, in filling me. And it's never going to. This is where materialism and you know the, the reckless capitalistic kind of mindset and perspective, again, without God there to temper and guide, it, it, it's, um, it's a dead end, mm-hmm. you know? I was just thinking the same thing there of, of how 
in America where America's full of prodigals, right? Um, that we're, I think we're taught maybe even by osmosis these days uh, more subtly than anything. This idea of the American dream is, you know, as you grow in success, you will grow in happiness. And that success requires you to, requires two things that I think the prodigal son like embodies. First, it's, I'm going to watch out for myself and only myself and nobody else. I'm going to prioritize me and not anybody else. And who cares what my dad has to say or what my brother has to say or what the other people have to say. I'm going to do what I think is best for me and own that. Um, and look where that gets him. I mean, he's, he's feeding pigs for a living, <laughs> you know. Um, but then the other thing, too, is I, I, I was really struck by it's like a demand, too. He doesn't ask the father hey, would you please, you know, give me my share of the property that will belong to me when you die? It's, Father, give me that right now, you know? And how, like, cold that is. And, and um, yeah, he, he he's turned it off. I was just thinking, too, of, like, you know, how often we see it in the church of, and in ourselves, especially where we grow up in the father's house and yet decide at some point that that is not, that's just not enough for me. You know, that, that gift in itself is not a good enough gift. I think there's something better out there. And so I demand my inheritance and let me go and set out on my own. Let me own myself and watch myself. And almost like that, that cutting off of that gift, that cutting off of that grace in many ways um and, and where that where that ends him up pretty quickly too honestly like the luke doesn't spend any time saying like and he spent you know 10 years of happiness or something like that yeah he's like he he got to the country and then he was out of money and now he's feeding pigs which is like the ultimate insult for the jewish people that you know the pigs were the unclean animals mm -hmm. and here he's eating you know feeding them the the fruit of the carob tree and uh you know which is just is pig's food and he'd be happy to eat that you know like it's the ultimate uh depravity you know and again this is to the point of where you know he you know again fortunately has an epiphany but the point is you know what we're seeing here also this speaks to the breakdown of the family which mm -hmm. is a big issue in our culture today we see it everywhere all the time is family important does family matter right if as our faith tradition teaches us that the the cell of, of the church is is the family right and the and the bedrock and the, and the beginning starting point um then the breakdown of the family is the destruction of the church and the faith you know our relationships are so important ten commandments right are there about relations between god and each other so this parable in itself even speaks at that level you know what I mean? Familiar relations. How does a how yeah. does a child relate to the father or to his sibling? All these dynamics are in there and important for us, especially in our day and age where the, they're just you know the family doesn't become the priority. I don't care. We I was married twenty five years. I'm out. No more for our marriage. This is happening more mm -hmm. and more. You know, even outside the church, but even within the church, people that no longer value the family. You know, and our families, yeah, may be imperfect, right? But um, the, the family is the school of love. It's the teaching of what love is about. Mm -hmm. And love is not about just self-sufficiency and making myself feel only good and nobody else. As you said, right, you know, you, he just doesn't care at all and breaks all those ties. And again, ultimately, where does it leave him, right? Nowhere, mm. you know, and thankfully in his case, he has a kind of an epiphany and an awakening and just sees this is this is crazy that even in my household, my family, the people that kind of were outside the family unit, the, the servants, even they were treated better than where I'm at now, mm -hmm. you know? Father Daniel Bowen, we're talking about the prodigal son and to that point of, uh, you know, this, the father figure and and the family dynamic you know, Cam, you had mentioned about the prodigal son, the younger son, going to the father and demanding what he was um, own, right? 
or maybe not even own, but what was coming to him. Yeah. And and this demand, the father even says yes to it, mm-hmm. right? And I'm struck by that because it just really talks about one our free will and 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 how much the father honors that, but also in that sometimes tough love is helpful, right? The father knows he's not going to go out there and find genuine fulfillment. And yet he says, okay, if you want to experience, um, you know, the, the consequences of your actions, I don't want that for you. I don't want that for you, but because you're demanding of, of me and you want this, go ahead and experience it. And the father never, he never wants evil in our lives, right? But he, he allows certain things so that we can, we can learn and that so we can be stretched and grown and pruned and, and then hopefully return to him. So the younger son now is out in the wastelands. The bottom falls out, right? He's left with nothing. Meanwhile, back at the house. The, Meanwhile, back at the ranch. <laughs> at the ranch. <laughs> the, uh, the older brother um, decides to stay. Mm-hmm. right but you look at um his, his comments um jumping further in, in, in the parable um <coughs> behold these many years i have served you and i never disobeyed your command yet you never gave me a kid and you know the party and everything else so we look at his disposition so where the younger son wants to get off the ranch um the older son remains but he's not doing it out of love i mean he he said i have served you he he's almost putting well he is putting himself in more of um position of a slave and as obedient and um i've done everything right and i'm due Mm -hmm. as well the younger son said i'm due give it to me now but the older son is still is still there and and thinks he's earned all this because of his because of his um his service and being a slave yeah even in the original uh, greek of this the older son refers to his younger brother as the one the one not yeah. my brother your son like yeah <laughs> yeah yeah mm-hmm. so he is you know yeah, the sibling rivalry, <laughs> right? In, in a sense here, that's, that's occurring. Um, and again, you know, whenever we begin comparing ourselves with anyone other than saints, <laughs> right? we can get into some murky water. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it, um, for all appearances, right? He, see, he was doing the right thing, the older brother, he's, but he's showing his hand here, like, right? The younger brother comes back. His father is like just ecstatic about it, right? Let's have a party. Really, this is a this is an a, this is a miracle. Someone's been raised from the dead. Right? Again, he kind of refers to that, but he was dead, you know, lost and found. Dead, he's to life. And the older brother just is, I don't care. You know, I I followed all the rules. I followed all the commandments. I did all the the things I'm supposed to be doing, and and, and there's there's nothing there, you know, f- for me. Or I'm not at a better position or I'm not being appreciated. So there's envy certainly in some ways, perhaps there, mm-hmm. you know, you know, I followed the rules and, and we can be that sometimes. Well, look at me. I followed all the rules, but yet I've got this diagnosis of cancer. Mm-hmm. Well, why do I get this cancer? And why doesn't this guy over here who did this other thing or, or whatever? Yeah. I've you been know? faithful. Why is this happening to me? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. Or, 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 you know, this is something, um, salvation or the father's love is something to be earned and, and to be one uh, and, there you have and, and, and so both both sons are incredibly self-centered in, into what they can get from the father i can i want my inheritance now or i'm going to stay behind and serve you and do everything right and be the great son so that I get, I still will get something from you, Father. Uh, and neither, neither of the sons are acting out of love. 
neither of them are living as sons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Neither of them are living in the presence of the father in the sense of being fathered. Like they they both have a distant, either distant or servile relationship with the father. And we're not called to be servants. We're called to be sons and daughters. Yeah, it's a very, there's a gross immaturity here in both of them, which is unusual because when we look at the figure of the father, right, here's like the, the most perfect father ever. Let's talk about the father yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we almost, we got to go there. because The prodigal father. And they're obviously yeah. not learning how to be like their dad, right? <laughs> or maybe they are. Yeah. This is maybe what we're seeing because obviously this is just a, a snapshot of them in one moment or, you know, in a certain t- time frame, but be hopefully beyond this, right, they will have learned and grown into their their own fatherhood, right, Uh, of what it means to truly be, you know, a mature uh, believer, right, a a mature uh, person. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, let's talk about the Father's mercy. I mean, this is a parable of mercy that the the lost and found department in in Luke chapter 15, you know, what was lost (laughs) now is found. So this is all about the Father's mercy. Let's first look at um how the father welcomes back the younger son it might be important to to look at traditionally how how would a father welcome back a son who's squandered his inheritance what would be the like you know not the way this father reacts but how maybe the rest of the town or something like that would have expected him to react you know i i've always had this image of you know I think the way when if you're reading this story for the first time, reading this parable for the first time, the way you expect the father to receive him is like his, you know, arms crossed, standing Mm. on the porch, you know, up a few steps. So he's taller than him, bigger than him. You know, don't even come and put yourself on the same level as me. And uh, you'd be lucky to be treated as as even one of my servants. And none of that language is the language that's used in. And I think obviously like there's there's it's worth saying but i think it's implied too that this the father here represents god the father represents god in general and and how he receives us obviously and when you look at scripture in general you you can almost start to infer oh he's not going to respond that way why because as you come to know god and as you come to know the father as father you you get to you get the sense of like Wait, he's going to respond different than than the traditional response, and so um, mm. I love that the father doesn't talk first; mm. he lets the son talk first. That's like one of my favorite moments in this passage. Well, maybe even right before there, Cam, how the younger son is rehearsing his speech when he gets back in front of his father, and. Um, how many of us, when we're separated, when we run from God, think in some way our sin, our lifestyle is too awful uh, to receive mercy? And that's what, so I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but that's where I, I kind of see now the younger son rehearsing how to get back into the Father's graces. He's probably said it a thousand times a thousand different ways in his head the entire i I mean it says he went to a different country so he's coming back from a country on foot yeah he has a long time (laughs) to to practice yeah Yeah. so he's really practicing this and and i what i like to imagine is you know the father's just running at him and so he sees the father recognize like clocks that it's him and he's like okay here we go father i've sinned against heaven and against you i don't i'm not worthy to be called your son he doesn't finish because I, I I guess the image that comes to my brain is that's the moment when the father embraces him. Mm. Yeah, and it's very un, it's unconventional. You you did not uh, in that culture. Your father would not bow to you or run to you. You ran to him. You were his inferior. So the fact that this father like runs to his son, I mean that in itself is. Um, remarkable ex- extraordinarily and again it's saying here uh, the father saw him and had compassion yeah and that word there is the same word that's used in the uh elsewhere in scripture uh for uh when when jesus speaks about the um the good samaritan mm-hmm. 
he had compassion this this deep gut-wrenching like from the depths kind of compassion not just like kind of sort of but the true love agape you know kind of um yeah above and beyond actually i'm so struck by that father because it says but while he was yet a distance off his father saw him and had compassion yeah so the the father is watching his son walk towards him while he is yet still a long distance off and he has maybe no idea what he's been doing no idea what he's going to come to him and say and yet mm. he has compassion he well, didn't hear a single word he didn't hear an apology <laughs> he, he, he didn't he already has compassion yeah and that just ah oh, like to the sinner's heart right to any of us that should tell us there is nothing that our lord wouldn't have compassion while we are still far way off mm. yeah that's absolutely right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he could have easily came and Amanda, uh, Father, Father Daniel Bowen, Amanda. You've all kind of mentioned this that um, an earthly father um, would lack so much of this. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's you know, I'm going to wait for the child to apologize. We're going to um, put out some some punishment. You know, some reparation has to be done. You know, you break a window, you're going to replace the window and repair it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, an earthly father is going to think of these things. You know, let's have a little bit of groveling here. Not God our Father. He's already made up his mind when he sees the son approaching. It's all about compassion and mercy at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, again, that's where the older son right he speaks a lot of what we would think right oh well yeah there should be punishment there should be consequences mm-hmm. right um and, and so he's kind of almost speaking that kind of thought for us but even look at the the father's response to the older son right the older son i'm not going in that party i'm not going to be a part of it the father goes out to him he also goes out to that son mm-hmm. as well uh where, where we see that right and allows that son to explain himself, right, as uh, um, it was pointed out, you know, allows him to kind of speak his heart. Mm. Um, but the father doesn't just leave him out there. He, he goes to his son. Our Lord will come, is, comes to us. Yeah. You know, he won't, he won't force himself completely, but he, he, he makes himself available. He avails himself of us, no matter where we are if we've made ourselves separate right i'm not gonna be part of this party or i go off in the way distant lands but i want to make that movement back god's like i'm here yeah father daniel bowen i don't think i've ever really noticed that part before because you're right in this section on the older brother it says his father came out and entreated him and in both situations with both sons the father is there and available waiting for his son like not only there and watching the younger son come back and running towards him, but but there and available and walking towards his older son and and asking him to come with him. He just yeah, he just right. wants us to be with him. Let's be a family. He wants the Let's family be to be together. That's it. He no. wants the family to be together. God the Father wants the family to be together. Mm-hmm. Right? No matter the ways you've kind of run off to 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 be mindful of the Father. He's calling, he's summoning us all back. You know, he summons us, in the way he summons us back, he wants us to be in church every Sunday. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a loving Father saying, come home and be with me. It isn't, you gotta do this. It's, wow, you get to do this. We get to be a family. What a beautiful and wonderful thing that is. And, you know, uh, both of the sons are welcome in this house, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Uh, you know, so. And, and for, and for the older son, you've you've been here. I appreciate that, but I want your love. Yes, you know I want you right. to love your brother, and I want you to love me. And let's all rejoice. And as they say here, and they made merry. Mm. <laughs> I think in this, I'm just struck by the father's heart, and that he he wants his children home, and and so I'm just gonna throw it out there for all, all of our friends. If you're away from home, if you're away from the church, if you're away from God. Just come home. Amen. Amen. Would you like to hear what Teresa Lisieux said about this? Yeah. Yeah. In chapter eight of the story of the soul, she says this. She says, what joy to remember that our Lord is just, 
that he makes allowances for all our shortcomings and knows full well how weak we are. What have I to fear then? Surely the God of infinite justice, who pardons the prodigal son with such mercy, will be just with me, who am always with him. Mm. St. Therese, mic drop. (laughs) (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Bam, there it is. But if that wasn't enough, I hold in my hand (laughs) Pope Benedict's commentary on this that he gave in an Angelus address in 2010. Shall I? Please. Dear brothers and sisters, the gospel of the father and the two sons, better known as the parable of the prodigal son, is proclaimed. This passage of St. Luke constitutes one of the peaks of spirituality and literature of all time. Indeed, what would our culture, art, and more generally our civilization be without this revelation of a God, the Father, so full of mercy? It never fails to move us, and every time we hear or read it, it can suggest to us ever new meanings. Above all, this gospel text has the power of speaking to us of God, of enabling us to know his face, and better still, his heart. After Jesus has told us of the merciful Father, things are no longer as they were before. We now know God. He is our Father, who out of love created us to be freed and endowed us with a conscience, who suffers when we get lost and rejoices when we return. For this reason, our relationship with him is built up through events, just as it happens for every child with his parents. At first, he depends on them. Then he asserts his autonomy. And in the end, if he develops well, he reaches a mature relationship based on gratitude and authentic love. In these stages, we can also identify moments along man's journey in his relationship with God. There can be a phase that resembles childhood, religion prompted by need, by dependence. As man grows up and becomes emancipated, he wants to liberate himself from his submission and become free and adult, able to organize himself and make his own decisions, even thinking he can do without God. Precisely this stage is delicate and can lead to atheism. Yet even this frequently conceals the need to discover God's true face. Fortunately for us, God never fails in his faithfulness. And even if we distance ourselves and get lost, he continues to follow us with his love, forgiving our errors and speaking to our conscience from within in order to call us back to him. In this parable, the sons behave in opposite ways. The younger son leaves home and sinks ever lower, whereas the elder son stays at home. But he too has an immature relationship with the father. In fact, when his brother comes back, the elder brother does not rejoice like the father. On the contrary, he becomes angry and refuses to enter the house. The two sons represent two immature ways of relating to God. Rebellion and childish obedience. Both these forms are surmounted through the experience of mercy. Only by experiencing forgiveness, by recognizing one is loved with a freely given love, a love greater than our wretchedness, but also than our own merit, do we at last enter into a truly filial and free relationship with God? Mm. Pope Benedict Pope the 16th. Pope Benedict the 16th. As yes. read by Father Daniel Bowen. We're talking about the prodigal son here in the cafe. Brings to mind also, Father, um, uh, as biological mothers and fathers, as, as spiritual fathers, um, What's the most important gifts that we can give, you know, to our children? And it's, we see the response 
from the children that the father wants, right? I mean, he wants, he wants to have the gratitude. He wants uh, the children's love. But then what are, what are we giving our children? Um, yeah, we, we want to lavish on them. We want to give them things. We want to provide a comfortable uh, lifestyle. But we can't forget the most important thing that we can give them is, is, is love, mercy, forgiveness and that those are those are the actions that keep families whole yeah right or on the opposite spectrum what keeps them divided mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah practically father uh here in the season of lent we're in inviting our friends to reconcile um and to heal the relationships um that hurt the body, you know, yeah. hurt hurt our um, our families, um, our community, uh, the church. Um, what what are the steps that we can do now, um, starting today, uh, to make those reconciliations? Yeah. the best thing is go to confession, especially if it's been a long time, and it doesn't matter how long it's been. You know, maybe it's been forty, fifty years. Come home. Mm -hmm. come to confession you know that's the first step really again throw yourself into god's arms right allow yourself to be regenerated by his merciful love that's the first step take that step or again if it's been a while you know you know again the practice of regular confession it's a reconciling with God, but not just God. It's also our brothers and sisters, our family, our friends, somebody on their side of the world we don't know. We just never know, right? All sin and, again, staying away from God, staying away from his commandments. Uh, these are, these are uh, things that break our relationship with God, but with each other as well. So the way to come back is, is, is that repentance and that conversion, allowing God to allow love to, to rule, to guide, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what God's desire is, you know? And it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. His if, mercy and forgiveness is always greater. That's yeah. it. That's yeah. it, right? And allow that to be. Allow, and, and encounter it. Don't just look at it from afar, right? Come mm -hmm. home yeah. and watch the Father running to you and embracing you, right? And in that moment, getting the best robe, <laughs> you know, slaughtering the fattened calf. You know, I, I kind of get the image of, uh, you know, the father yelling from a half a mile away to the son and the son yelling his uh, his repentance and, you know, from, <laughs> from, you know, from far away. There's no embrace. Right. I mean, there that reconciliation ends in an embrace. Yeah, um, exactly. it's, not, it's not done done from a distance. Cam on that confession note, too, I'd encourage all of our friends wherever you are not looking at the sacrament of confession as this I'm regaining my seat at the table so to speak like I've been eating in the kitchen this whole time because I'm ashamed and so finally I can sit back down at the table woohoo you know but really it, it's a going to confession so that the father can remind you that you are son mm -hmm. that you are daughter and because we lose that when, when you look at the I was the last bit that I was struck by was both of the sons are identifying themselves as slave or servant or unworthy or whatever it is. And the first words out of the father's mouth to the second son, the first word is the word son. He mm. addresses him as who he actually is. And isn't that what confession is all about? Is It's that restoration of, of identity, of reminding you when you show up to the sacrament, it's not about that I'm earning something back, but it's it's a remember. Remember who you are. Yeah. Remember you are son. Remember you are daughter. Yeah, sin can cloud that. We can forget who we who we are. You know, that's why removing that sin allows us to see clearly. We are beloved sons and daughters of God most high. Mm -hmm. And the sin doesn't undo doesn't undo that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It obscures it. And again, that's why we can continually keep falling into sin because we're so, we're not seeing clearly we're not feeling loved we were not feeling or sensing god's love we begin to look for 
uh, consolation elsewhere, right? And uh, that's why coming back home to God, coming back home to the family of the faith, um, that is truly coming home and allowing that joy and that peace. Again, the fullness of it's in heaven. It isn't here, folks, but it, it can begin to be here. This is a gift God has given to us. And what a great, incredible, amazing, um, uh, it's more than an experience, but a reality that right. that is. Right. right. Yeah. Amanda? I, I think also just, Cam, in what you said of just remembering that we are son and daughter, this this is such a great passage, Luke 15, 11 through 32, to just go back to time and time again and to remind yourself that, that you are son, you are a daughter, and to, to rest in that he is a good, good father, and he is always calling us into deeper relationship with him. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. <laughs> Friends, there's plenty of opportunities in these remaining weeks of Lent um, to reconcile, uh, to uh, come back to to the Father and, and, and to, know, um, to know his love and to rediscover uh, your identity. The place where I would start is by going to your parish's uh, website or bulletin, find out reconciliation times. So many uh, parishes now are offering uh, evenings of uh, reconciliation as well as extended times uh, before and after Masses. So um, don't think your sin is too great. Uh, God's mercy is even greater. Mm -hmm. Father Daniel, Daniel Bowen, thanks for being in here in the cafe with us. You're welcome. It's an honor, a pleasure. Amanda, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>